Yeah, Mr. Thompson, please. Hey, Mr. Thompson, Jeremy Norton, we were chatting yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you did. You love it. Perfect. Uh, amazing. Oh, thank you so much. So yeah, all you need to do, sign the bottom of that contract, fax it back to us, and uh, we're good to go. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Yep, if there's any problems at all, just you have my number, just give me a call. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a great day. Bye. Hey, sir. So, uh, Captain Energy, they just called, and uh, they're, they're going to go with us. So, it's, it's basically 30, 30% increase from last year, and uh, they're going to go with us the next five years. So, we're good to go. Yeah. Hey, money's rolling through Calgary, and we're getting a piece of the pie. So, it's, it's amazing. It's great. <laughs> no, no, still headed to Alaska. Yeah, I understand. No, I, I probably won't make as much money working for Jesus. I, yeah, no, uh, it, you know, it's a call on my life, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm going for it. Yeah, we're we're set up for the next guy, whoever that is, or or gal. You know, that their numbers are good, clients are good. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure though, I'm going. All right, yeah, chat later, bye. That was my life. That was the moment when Jesus put a call on my life, moved me from a career in sales that I was actually really great at. And I was making good money. I had a, you know, a biweekly salary, and then every three months I would get sales bonuses based on what I put on that board, a percentage. I got a cut. Life was good. It was hard for people to understand. But all of a sudden, I was like headed in this direction in a career that probably I could have been managing a sales office by now, or maybe even managing my own hotel or uh, leading huge conferences. I, I don't know. I don't know where I might be, but, but Jesus, I was heading on this direction, and Jesus called me the other way. We've been going through a series called Gospel of Conflict, looking at Mark's gospel account. And... When we consider today's passage, it's really about that call to ministry. What happens when Jesus puts a call on someone's life and calls them completely out of where they're going, and they go on a totally different trajectory? What does that mean for life? What does that do? How do things change? Dreams, aspirations. If you have a Bible or there's a Bible in a seat in front of you, turn to Mark 6, Mark chapter 6. If you're new to church, the first two-thirds of your Bible is the Old Testament, last third is the New Testament, and Mark is in the New Testament. It's actually the second book. It goes Matthew, Mark, so you can get there. If you don't know how to look it up, no problem. If, uh, if you look to the table of contents, you'll see Mark and you can go there. Or if you have a Bible app or you can download the Bible app that we use here, the Share Faith Bible app, and you can keep up with uh, the sermon notes and, and check things back through the week and interact, uh, you can do that. And you can just type in Mark 6 in the search uh, column there in the app and it'll uh, bring you to it. 
So we're going to Mark 6, and we're going to look at verses 7 to 13. Up to this point, you know, uh, Jesus had called the 12 disciples, he had called the, these 12 soon-to-be leaders out of their careers. You know, last week we talked about some were fishermen, some were tax collectors. Called them out of their careers, but they've kind of been in apprenticeship mode up till this moment. And they've been following Jesus, and Jesus has been taking uh, the brunt of the work, and they've been watching, and he's been showing them kind of what to do, what, a, what it means to shepherd people. But in this po- moment in the Gospels, Jesus actually sends them out two by two, and they're going to start doing some of the work. And so we're going to catch it up there, starting in verse 7 of, of chapter 6. It says, And he, being Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. All right, so there's, there's a couple conflicts that come here. Now, the first one, the first one that we need to wrestle with is the primary conflict of ministry is one with society. Because society, even in first century and now, states that, you know, you grow, you learn a trade or a business or a career, you, you do that thing, you earn money, you get money for your family, maybe you put a little bit away, you, you, you maybe pay for some uh, food, uh, housing, clothing, things like that. You maybe have a bit for fun or entertainment or leisure, and then you save some for uh, maybe retirement or for the next generation. And this is kind of a societal understanding of what you do in your adult life, and you contribute to society in that way. The conflict of ministry says you're going to actually deny the societal norm, and you're going to go into part-time, full-time ministry and do something totally outside of what society would perceive you to do. So that's a conflict. How does society wrestle with that? My boss didn't really understand why I would leave a great job making good money to go up to Alaska to take my first ministry career and be a pastor. That just seemed totally absurd. Because to society, it's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. And which leads to the secondary conflict, which is an individual conflict. That every person has the potential that Jesus may one day call them out of their life and society and everything and call them to be in full-time ministry. I, I don't know who he's going to call next. I don't know who it's going to be. It might be any of you here today. But each individual needs to ask, Jesus, what am I supposed to do in this world? And some are called to just be in volunteer ministry. Some people, God actually, I believe, puts in the workplace and serves in that capacity. But every once in a while, Jesus calls someone out of the regular workplace, out of their regular societal role, into something different. And so, as we dig into this, the first thing we look at in this passage, in this conflict of ministry, and if we look at the disciples calling now, they've, they've been apprenticing, they've been learning. You know, I, I equate it to, you know, while I was still working in this job, I was doing nights and weekends, and I was going to Alberta Bible College to learn uh, for some great professors. I was interacting with some other guys that, uh, in a program that was called for, that was for adult uh, students, people that had already had a career, and so it was interesting, uh, the crew that I hang out, hung out with, there was one guy who was a surveyor, uh, another guy, he, he worked in like body shop and did graphics on vehicles, and so lots of different people that were there that were being called out of their workplace to be in full-time ministry, so we were learning together, but at some point, we needed to kind of head out. At some point, I needed to, to close down this role in my life, and I needed to get in the vehicle and, and start my new career. And so these, these disciples now, they're being sent out two by two, and they've got to go. Well, this, this whole interesting thing about two by two, uh, I think it's really pertinent. I think it's a great lesson there for any pastor. Here at Mountain View Church, I'm not a priest. There's not just like this solo guy that holds the bag for everything, and, and I'm the guy. And, and I don't think we see that in Scripture. Jesus is the guy 
We are the people serving Jesus. And so for here, we have a pastor elder team. Every Monday we meet, we pray, and, and I don't hold all the secrets. And this is a hard thing when people first come into my church, uh, you know, in, in coming here and interacting with me, they believe that it's like my church and I'm maybe as a pastor, some sort of priest, and they're going to do confessional with me and I'm going to be the keeper of all secrets. And, and, you know, then I have to say, well, just wait a second. Before you start divulging, you know, that you robbed a bank, um, just so you know, there's going to be more people here. That doesn't really happen, but it's a joke. But everyone's like, what? <laughs> okay, so like people want to, de- they, they want me to like absolve everything for them. Well, no, 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 no. Jesus is the guy. I'm just a guy working for Jesus. And there's a few other guys that have been elected by this church to serve alongside of me. And we do this together. We journey together. And so anything you tell me, like the pastor, elder team, we share this together. We share the weight. And I think it's important to see here that Jesus knew enough that he can't send these guys out on their own. They, they were sent out in pairs. They need to bear this weight. There's a loneliness. There's a burden. There's a, there's a substantial uh, amount of weight that comes on a pastor that needs to be shared. And even for me, every two weeks, I meet with uh, Pastor Simon at, at Yukon Bible Fellowship. And they're like crazy charismatic and flag waving, which is awesome that like I'm a conservative Baptist and we hang out for coffee. It's like the start of a good joke. Um, but what we both have is we're solo pastors kind of working in Whitehorse. And he was called out of the geology field to be a pastor. I was called out of sales and, and, and tourism into this. And so we have this calling where we have a previous career. And so we share a lot of the same things like in, in you know, what's it like for our wives being married to pastors and our children. And, and so we have this, but the whole idea here, I think that Jesus is calling people who are into ministry. It's not a solo gig. You, you have got to share this with someone. So I think that's an important thing to note. Next, as we move into verses 8 through 11, we see some interesting things here. And and this is where it gets a little bit weird, where when you first read it, you're like, what's this all about? Jesus first gives them like a a dress code. He gives them a dress code. And, um, you know, he talks about no bag, no money, you know, wear sandals, but don't wear two coats. Like, what is this all about? Well, this is actually, this is actually a pointer back to Exodus 12. Jesus, by, their, by listing their dress code, he's pointing back to really the first savior of Israel. Way back in Exodus, there's a guy by the name of Moses. If you're not familiar with church, he's, he's kind of the, the first big, big important leader as far as biblical history goes. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. And um, we, we get an account of both, cre- you get creation, worldwide flood, you get, you get the, the establishment of the law. And, and so this is really foundational stuff that, that, that Moses writes down. Now Moses had a very special call on his life early on. And through strange circumstances, he found himself, even though he was a Hebrew, he found himself in the courts of the Egyptians, in Pharaoh's court. And he was learning, and he was in, like, the know, in the most kind of rich and learned and, and the, the smartest, most intelligent culture in the Egyptian culture at that time. And that was, Moses became his worldview. But all of a sudden, he grows, and there's a tension because... The race that he was, the Hebrew people were actually enslaved by Egypt. And so Israel's enslaved by Egypt and there's a tension there and he ends up uh, lashing out. He ends up murdering an Egyptian and fleeing for his life and kind of abandons this tension, this conflict that God puts on his life. But while he's out in a foreign land and he's at this point, God, he's like a career shepherd. He's doing his thing. God calls him out of a burning bush. If you've heard that account, you've been around church, uh, a bush that's continuing to burn, but not burning up. And uh, Moses goes to see what this thing is. And God calls out of that, attracts him out to the wilderness and then calls him out of the the burning bush and says, you need to go back to Egypt and I'm going to use you to save my people. So then we get into the whole account. If you haven't read it, you should read it of the 10 plagues. And in the last plague, the death of the firstborn And that's where we get Passover. Passover becomes communion in the New Testament church. So there's lots of things to unpack. If this is all new to you, grab my card. My cell phone's on it as you leave. We're going to go for coffee, and I'll give you the whole in-depth journey. Be my pleasure. Okay? So either way, there's, there's this concept where it's the night before 
And Moses is told, tell people to wear a certain dress code. They need to be dressing in such a way that it's lightweight, so it's ready to go. Tonight, God's people will be saved, and they need to be dressed ready to go. And this same dress code that Jesus gives these disciples was given way, way, way back to the Israelites before they were going to flee from Egypt. And it's this dress code of be quick on your feet, let nothing be burdening you down. And it's funny, there's no money, no food, as if that would be a burden. But, but you know, these disciples are starting with zero. They're not starting in debt, but they're not starting with a surplus. They're heading out, they're heading out with a fresh start. And they're heading out with nothing, but also uh, having to depend on God's faith. And it's interesting that Jesus chooses this dress code for these disciples, which points back to the first time God saved the Israelites. And now these young men uh, are going to go out to the villages and they're going to start unpacking the story of not just a salvation of a certain race of people, but these guys are going to start unpacking a story of the salvation of all people. It's quite amazing. It's quite fascinating. And so when people would have seen how these men were dressed to a primarily Jewish audience that knew the first five books of the Bible, they would have been like, there's something interesting about what those guys are wearing. They're pointing back to a time when we were told to wear that, when we were running from Egypt to the promised land. And so their dress is, re- is resembling, we're headed to the promised land. But then it gets to this other thing. It's this crazy part. Jesus says then, he gives a final testimony. He, he wants to give a final testimony. He, he says, if you go into a home and they reject you. So they, they call for repentance. They tell the person about Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Son of God. And they're like, yeah, whatever. You're crazy. Get out of my house. Get off my property. But they're supposed to do this thing where they shake the dust of that household or that property off at the door, and Jesus says as a final testimony to them. Well, what's that all about? Well, that's actually a point forward. See, in the first century, um, Hebrew people that were in the Promised Land, Israel, they're in the Holy Land, if they traveled abroad, and they traveled abroad, and they maybe had to do business there or travel for family or whatever it was, before they crossed the border, there was a, cultural thing where they would shake the dust of the foreign land off their feet and they would step into the promised land again, the holy land. It's this idea that we don't want anything of the foreign world, anything from these other cultures to enter the promised land. God has given us this land. He's given us the promised land. We want to shake even the dust. We don't even want a speck of dust to come off. So this is a cultural thing in this moment. So Jesus telling them to do this if they had been able to see, if you can get your mind into first century Jewish culture, when they see this and they're looking and and at the door and these guys look back and they give a little tap, shake out their sandals and walk away, they are stating that this, this household is now foreign soil. This was the promised land, but now that you have rejected Jesus, this is a final warning. And they could have been like, oh, you know, hellfire and damnation and oh, you're they could have done all that. But Jesus doesn't ask them to do that. There's a light, mild testimony, just with a, with a hint of truth, but enough that they, that they have to be left with it. To say, you have just rejected the Son of God. And there's coming a day when it won't be about physical soil anymore. Before, it has been about one race of people, and it has been about one border and one physical land, but a time is coming. The Messiah will bring in a new thing, which will be all countries, all people, all race, every nation, tribe, and tongue will then be God's people. And the dividing line, the border, will be those that reject Jesus or accept him. And so Jesus saying, and tap the dust off your feet is a final testimony to them. Just to say, we're leaving now. But please, please, deeply, deeply consider whether or not you want to reject Jesus as the Messiah. And then they leave. 
So Jesus has this crazy in his instruction, a point backwards and a point forwards. Because at this time, this is all new. Is Jesus really the Messiah? Is he the one that was promised? Then we move on to uh, verses 12 to 13, and there's a real, it's an interesting thing of obedience there. What, what job are these guys supposed to do? It, it says that they went around, you know, their instruction and what they did, they had to go around proclaiming, proclaiming repentance. Well, you know, maybe, maybe, so proclaiming repentance, but what about proclamation of the gospel? Well, you have to remember what time period is then. Jesus hasn't yet died on the cross. He hasn't resurrected. He's still going about teaching, and he's gathered these 12 and sent them out. So th- at that time, there's, there, this is a message, this gospel message is to repent, to deny yourself because the Messiah is here. The Savior of the world is here. The Son of God is here. He's landed. It's time to get your heart ready. So all the things that you think are most important, all the things that you're worshiping in your life, you need to lay them down. And they're going because the Messiah is here. Get your heart ready. The same same message that John the Baptist, before Jesus came in and got baptized, the same thing John was saying, the Messiah is coming. Get your heart ready. Repent to your sin. Repent to your self-centeredness. Repent to your selfishness. It's time to put God center because Jesus is here. But it's important to note, Jesus didn't just send them out. These guys also went with Jesus' authority. And so when they came across people who were demon-possessed, Jesus' authority rested on them. And they were actually able to deal with demonic oppression and possession and cast out demons and drive them away, which was unbelievable to think about. But then they also, also part of their role was to anoint people with oil and, and, and to pray for them and lay hands and people were getting healed. Th- this was their call. This, this was meant to be their mandate. And so if I think about this, you know, when, when I think about the modern world and when someone's called into full-time ministry, you know, it's so interesting. One of the major things... One of the major things is proclamation. Now, we're on the back end in that we've experienced the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're there pre, uh, pre-resurrection, we're post-resurrection, but the proclamation is the same. Turn from yourself and accept Jesus. Place Jesus in the center of your world. And so every single pastor, as soon as Jesus calls you to something, that becomes primary. Like, I knew it was coming when I was sitting here, but more and more, it started to get harder, deeper, and, and, and I would go to church, and I would sit just like you are, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't tell enough. It was, it was becoming overwhelming that I needed to dive fully into this. And what's interesting, you know, a pastor, sometimes churches will uh, you know, get after a pastor, get annoyed a, at a pastor because it's like, oh, you know, all he talks about is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's a big Bible, you know? Like, can't we, like, why does it always have to come back to Jesus? And this is like a legitimate thing that people get angry at pastors for. And, and you know, just teach things of the Bible, good, tidy principles that'll help my life and leave it at that. You're supposed to, you read the Bible, find three key principles on how to make your life better, you give those, you pray, you leave. But you're missing that that initial call, a pastor almost has to deny himself. Because what's going on inside a pastor's spirit is the Holy Spirit is revealing how this entire book leads to Jesus. That this whole back end, everything in it, it's like you're aware and some of it's through study and commentaries, but other it's just, you just start seeing connections. And, it, and it's all pointing to Jesus. Every sermon ends with Jesus. And then if you're looking in the New Testament, well, Jesus is resurrected. Okay, well, now we just do three principles for life and, you know, you go on. But the thing is, is the whole New Testament points to Jesus coming back. And, and, and so everything and everything, like everything about the Bible, everything about a pastor's call if he tries to separate Jesus from his call, he, he's actually like internally dividing himself. And, and 
so if if you end up staying at our church, if you're new, that's great. If you're visiting, or that's, that's great. If you're headed on. If you land at a church, if you don't hear about Jesus very often, leave. Because there's something going on there. It all points to Jesus, both in his death and resurrection and, and the new life that comes through him. And then it points to his coming back. And so these guys, that's what it was all about. It was all about Jesus. They're casting out demons in Jesus' name. They're healing people in Jesus' name. It, it, it is all about him. And so for me, I can't do anything. It's like impossible to, to rip away the words of the gospel from my mouth. But then I look at these other things and I think about casting out demons. I've never come across demonic oppression or possession in all my life, in all my ministry. And I wonder, if some guys I've heard have, and I, I don't know, I just have to leave it to, that's not my call. But then there's this other thing. Anointing sick for healing. And, you know, in the New Testament, sorry, my... I have this little clip that clips to the back of my shirt and it came off. Forgive me. And then all of a sudden it starts pulling my head back and my mic goes back. There we go. All fixed. There's no real instruction on how to cast out demons in the New Testament, which is an interesting thing. I don't, I don't even know how you do that. But it is fascinating that there's very clear instruction on how to pray for and anoint the sick. In James 5, James being Jesus' little brother, he writes a letter to the church and he outlines in chapter 5 how, uh, how, you know, dealing for the sick works. And that the sick person, the person who's ill or afflicted, that they should call the elders forward. So the, the pastor elder team for us calls them, uh, you know, to their home and, and that there needs to be a time of confession and that confess to one another. And then that there's this, this also this time of, um, of anointing with oil. Now, oil in the Old Testament, it represents grace and mercy. And so I don't exactly know, because it's just olive oil. Why would they pour olive oil on their heads? I don't, I don't know. I know what it means, that you're actually pouring the grace and mercy of the Lord symbolically on the person. Maybe that's part of it. But, but then I also wonder, I wonder if it's a, a kind of a saving thing for the pastor, that, that the pastor doesn't become a televangelist and start healed, healed, healed. Where's the oil, pastor? So maybe there's like a preventative measure there. I don't know. Keep the pastor from becoming a holy roller. I don't know. But, but there's also this idea, well, it's not just him. It's, it's, it's a team of elders. It's th- that there's more. And, and they lay hands on the person. And there's this confession and this deep, deep calling out that Jesus will heal this person. Now, I haven't had any experience with demonic oppression or possession, but I've had experience with healing. And in my first ministry, actually, the one that I left this sales job and I headed to Alaska, I, I was the youth pastor, but I got called in to this, to this prayer service for this elderly lady. And she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and she'd been given six months to live. And she was like, I'm not ready. You know, Jesus still has stuff for me to do. And it's like, okay, well, and so we go over to her house and the, the elders and, and the pastors had kind of prepared their hearts and confessed. And we had assumed that this, this elderly lady, that her and her husband had kind of prepared, but no, she was saving it for while we were there. So we gather around her and she says, well, I'm going to start, I'm going to confess. She obviously knew her Bible and uh, my mind was blown. I never thought sweet little old ladies had sin in their life, but they got a whole lot going on upstairs. And, uh, so I'm like, listen, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't be here. I, I'm like a youth pastor. I'm, I'm in my late twenties. I'm like, what is going on right now? But this, this gal, she's all in. She's facing eternity and she's not ready to go. She's like, what do I got to lose? And, and there's this moment of confession. And then the, the senior pastor pours, pours a bit of olive oil on her head and then we place hands on her shoulders and on her back and, and we pray for her. And a few of us take turns. And I've, to this moment, I have never, ever in my entire life felt closer to the Holy Spirit than I did in that moment. And I don't know why exactly. And I never had it happen like that. But, you know, she was an elderly lady and she had terminal cancer. Like, I have to admit, I, I kind of thought, you know, this is it. This is how you're supposed to go. Well, I was like nine years ago, and I go to Alaska 
like next month, and we'll probably see her. She, she was healed right there. She went back to the doctor, cancer went into remission, never came back, healed. And she's, she, she's, a, she's a spry old gal. She's, yeah, loves Jesus, serves Jesus. She's going to serve Jesus till the day he takes her out. And so somewhere in that world and somewhere in her faith and her desire to not be ready, and Jesus chose to heal her. And so this is another component of full-time pastoral ministry that's a, that's a hard one to kind of understand because it's, it doesn't always go like that. Sometimes you get called to lay hands on someone to anoint them with oil, and they die. What's with that? Sometimes they don't get healed. And I don't know what it is, and yet I can't get away from, there's pretty clear instruction that that's what pastors need to do. So this is what these guys do. Now, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, Todd's going to tell you at the, end of the, at the end of the service a little bit what's going on, but there's an invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this if you want to kind of dig into more of this passage and what's going on. But to kind of end things this morning, the only individual call, the only way to wrap this up really, the only way I could think of is there really this secondary conflict, the individual, this, this high calling to, to leave a career. And, and it's strange because I know for statistically most of you, you know, you're listening to this, it's like, okay, well, it's good to learn about what it's like to be in full-time ministry, but um, it doesn't really apply to me. And, and yet, I understand that a decade ago, I was, I was just sitting in a seat in a church, in our sister church in Airdrie, Alberta. And I was just working, and then little by little... Jesus was like, I need more of your time. And I was serving on the worship team, and I was serving in youth ministry, and I, I was, you know, doing what I could whenever. And, and, but Jesus was like, no, I need everything. And that was really hard for me to process, because I'm like, I headed this way, and my wife's not a big fan of being a pastor's wife, and, you know, how's she going to take this? And Will she kill me? You know, I, I, like the, there was all this. And so I have to understand that maybe for someone here, they might be facing that. They might be sitting there and they're headed in one trajectory, but Jesus is saying, no, I, this is what I want you for life. And so as we end this morning, like I, I kind of have to ask each one of us, am I, am I called to part-time or full-time ministry? Maybe one of you are, and, and if you are, please let us know. I, our, our fellowship of churches across the Pacific Coast in BC and Yukon, they, they've called all pastors and elders to identify 2,500 new leaders, anyone who feels called to part-time or full-time ministry and to start investing with them, or people wanting to volunteer in a higher capacity. And so if that's you, like we have... We have mentorship programs that we're already running in, in eldership and ministry leader. We, we can create internships. There's an immerse program that gets you to work at the church or work in, in your field and, and do uh, biblical studies. And there's lots of options. But if, if Jesus is putting a call, either part-time or full-time, on your life to serve him, please let us know. We want to do everything we can to empower people who are called to ministry. And that's in any capacity. I've been talking about pastoral ministry, but there is a a huge world of ministry, and lots of people serve part-time or full-time in lots of different capacities. So if that's you, you know, uh, just let us know. But on the other side, as we respond this morning, we're going to sing one last time and uh, there's an opportunity to sing, to pray, uh, to give if you've brought money, cash, check, or you want to give online to help our church. That'd be great. Thank you so much if you've chosen to do that. But there's also the serve component. Maybe you're not called to part-time or full-time ministry, but every single follower of Jesus is called to do something. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, there is a gift that the Holy Spirit has given you to serve the local church. And, and we need you. And I understand it's summer and it's difficult, but ramping up in the fall, uh, you know, think about in the fall, where, where are you going to serve? What are you going to do, uh, you know, as part of your discipleship of Jesus, as part of following Jesus? And if you don't know, again, take my card or, or you know, talk at the welcome desk. There's lots of options. And, and 
there's lots of things that happen, and it might just be something as simply as helping someone across the street or making coffee or, you know, doing security to make sure our kids are safe. There are so many little things that can happen once a month. It's, it's, no, it's nothing in the grand scheme of things, but it's your individual call. And some of you are, are serving Jesus in your businesses, and I know that. I have heard stories uh, uh, of you using your gifts and abilities and using the gospel to reach in your business and your trade and stuff, and I'm so thankful that you're doing that. So today as we respond, whether you're here to sing, to pray, to give, or to serve, uh, I just ask that we just stand and we're just going to spend a moment giving back to Jesus. Let me pray. Dear Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the call of ministry you placed on the 12 disciples, which would end up becoming the leaders of the church, which would 2,000 years later lead to us. I thank you for that. I thank you for putting a call on my life. Um, it's hard to know where I would have been otherwise, and, and I'm sure uh, I would have had a decent, successful career. And, uh, but Lord, I, I really don't look back. I'm so thankful that you called me out of that to be a pastor, and I just pray that you continue to be with me and be with our elders as we lead this church. As we give of uh, our voices, our prayers, uh, our money, our possessions, our service to you, I pray that you would be pleased and you'd see it as worship. In Jesus' name, amen.